Welcome to this session titled, Digital Impressions, Embedding Assessments and Automating Data Collection Using a Learning Management System. My name is Fred Barak. I hold the position of Director of Assessment for Kansas State University and am the Graduate Chair for Music Education. I was co-chair in the development of the model cornerstone assessments that were developed and tested to align with the United States national standards and recently co-edited a new text for music assessment. And my name is Phil Payne and I am an associate professor and chair of music education at Kansas State University. I helped design and pilot the technology model cornerstone assessment and recently joined my colleagues Kelly Parks, Fred Burak, and Brian Wesolowski in writing development and applying assessments in the music classroom. I currently serve as a facilitator for the program admission alignment and assessment ASPA for the Society of Music Teacher Education and currently serve as the chair of the assessment SHRIG for NAFME. This paper will provide an historical view of current standards-based assessment in music and an overview of standards-based projects within the environment of educational accountability. We will share the policies and procedures that underlie the embedding of assessments using the state standards as the foundation of student learning outcomes within a pre-service music teacher curriculum at a large Midwestern university in the United States. We will then close by providing examples of how faculty work together to embed measures that assess student demonstrated proficiencies of licensure standards throughout our coursework while collecting a wealth of useful and rich, meaningful data. Music teacher licensing standards are statements indicating what teacher candidates should know and should be able to do in order to receive teaching license. These standards serve as the foundation upon which teacher education curricula are designed and guide the development and implementation of various instructional tasks intended to develop candidate proficiencies. Once designed, music education programs work to construct a framework of measures to best reflect the knowledge, the skills, and the dispositions attained by their respective students. Assessment in music teacher education involves measurement of musical, pedagogical, and dispositional competence with the primary goal of documenting proficiency in each of the aforementioned areas. Here we're looking at having skills in pedagogy, skills in creating, arranging, and improvising, skills in reading and writing music, skills in being able to select and analyze, interpret, describe, and the critical thinking skills that go along with each of those. And then are they able to assess student learning in the music classroom? And then we close that out with demonstrating professional responsibility. To fully understand implementation of our assessment process, I would like to share with you the structure that supports our discussion. The music education program defines the categories of learning and achievement levels expected upon degree completion for each program. Of course, these outcomes reflect the learning expectations that occur in courses across the curriculum. Assessments are integrated into the educational experiences and data is collected that reflects how students demonstrate the defined learning. Defined minimum proficiencies become the benchmark through which faculty employ a battery of assessments integrated throughout the curriculum at points where students are expected to demonstrate the defined level of competence. Standards for music teacher education programs reveal themselves in a variety of ways, including development and application. Additionally, teacher certification and licensure practices for music teacher candidates vary by state and across higher education institutions. The multifaceted nature of music teaching positions in schools are addressed by standards, and that's at the district, the state, and the national level, 
as well as teacher licensure, which requires a form of accountability. These additional entities allow for a more holistic view, which allows for a broader examination of the impact of our decisions based on a wider range of data. And so we are constantly in those cycles looking at the big picture, but we hold ourselves accountable on an annual basis on continuing to align our practices with our licensure standards, which then we re, uh, report back to the state. Now, within each one of these, we have embedded assessments throughout the entirety of our program. There are common assessment practices that include teaching portfolios, uh, evaluation of discrete musical competencies, observations of related field experiences, assessment of pre-service teacher dispositions, self and peer assessments, development of effective reflective practice. Each of the listed assessments are embedded across our entire curriculum and are strategically placed to ensure that we both scaffold these experiences for maximum effect during the internship semester, but to provide the program with meaningful data to allow us to determine whether specific knowledge and skills are being effectively understood and developed within each one of our candidates. Each of these assessments serve as a synthesis of a variety of skills that align with our licensing standards and vary in scope across knowledge, skills, and dispositions. So you will see something along the lines of an assessment portfolio. Well, that assessment portfolio isn't just a cadre of different assessments, it's defining what those assessments are intended to do, when they are appropriate, how to develop them authentically, fairly, and establishing reliability and validity and understanding how that works within the music classroom. And then being able to say, this is the type of assessment I need. This is when it's appropriate. And here's how I evaluate the data once I receive it. Classroom management plans that are built into handbooks, their philosophy of music education, being able to recruit. So how do we do that through the beginning band brochure? Contextual factors, understanding how the classroom impacts our instructional decisions. And then a series of where we have teaching standards reflections that actually goes in then to our students teaching master classes of being able to show videos of them teaching in the classroom and sharing those effective moments. Why was it effective? How would they do it the same way again in a different environment? How could they make those adjustments? Likewise, we have them do those master classes and reflect on what didn't go so well and being able to share this was ineffective. This is why it was ineffective. And here's the adjustments that I made in the following lesson and here's how it changed. And so that's where we begin to see that ability for the student to reflect. Well, that master class emerged from us being able to evaluate those data. And what we're going to look at today is how we have automated that process and how we use that annual review to continually make improvements at the instructional level, the course level, the program level. Remember early on, we talked about the standard and the knowledge, the skills and dispositions involved. We now take those knowledge, skills and dispositions and we align them with tasks within our teacher education sequence. Embedded within the scoring devices for these various assessments are these specific items that contribute to a final score of a grade on an assignment. Notice that they are not the whole grade. We then collect these across all of the embedded assignments and use the aggregate score to determine the extent to which a student demonstrates a knowledge base, a set of skills or dispositions. This is not a one-time assessment in a program that a student submits, but essentially a 3D model of the students as a whole based on their performance of the knowledge, the skills, the dispositions across a variety of tasks. Now this serves two purposes. One, it provides a comprehensive and authentic view of what the students can do 
and what they know, but it also provides a view of the student over time rather than just one snapshot in one semester within the program. Additionally, the items are aligned with the standards. And since they are aligned with the standards, we can precisely determine the knowledge, the skills, or the dispositions we want to improve or enhance, locate those within the specific tasks, adjust the task or the delivery of the content, and then remeasure the items to determine if the changes helped or hindered. And then regardless, this alignment allows us to have surgical precision in making changes to lesson, to instruction, to content delivery, to courses, course objectives, course sequence, to our curriculum. And at the top end, allows us to make changes to our program. We integrated the assessment structure into the learning management system and data analysis systems throughout coursework and field experiences allowing for a full automation of the collection of achievement data, enabling graphic and tabular visualizations. The methodology used to collect data began with scoring students demonstrating proficiencies using piloted and tested rubrics through our Canvas learning management system. Each assessment criterion was internally aligned and linked to the outcome categories enabling automated data collection. All data automatically flowed into the Power BI visualizations, which included graphs and tables that were filterable by gender, first generation, transfer status, ACT scores, and ethnicity with automated daily, daily refreshes. The visualizations allowed real-time data to be used to inform instructional decisions and to guide improvements in learning. The connections with demographic cohort disaggregation enabled interactive, immediate, and longitudinal analysis through the dashboards. Given the extent to which the data are collected and shared, faculty have multiple ways to disaggregate the data in meaningful examination of the curriculum at the atomic level by filtering by demographic categories, including the gender, ethnicity, first generation, and specialty areas, among others. The analysis that assist understanding possible interactions of learning, as well as correlations between skills and achievements described. We will look at a few ways that we're able to expose student needs through assessment data and some of the resulting considerations. In the assessed outcome category for music educational pedagogical skills, you'll see that there are six assessed criteria for which the overall percentage of achievement in each category of emerging, meeting expectations or exceeding expectations. Across the bottom of the screen, are five demographic categories, which we currently disaggregate. Let's say we look at gender diversity. I filter down to show only those who identify themselves as female. And we see at the bottom right graph that females are outscoring males in all assessed criteria. Across the bottom, you may also note that Although the females make up two thirds of the music education program population assessed, there's a slightly greater percentage that are first generation and non-white students. Decisions must be made as to the educational or possibly attitudinal needs of male students in the assessed criteria and consider focused assessments that uncover the foundational value var variables that influence male students' achievement. Let's look at another category of learning. Students' achievement in listening, analyzing, describing, and performing. When I filter to non-white students, we see that the cohort is equally, does equally well in reading and visual recognition. 
describing and modeling and teaching musical form. Analysis would look deeper into the foundational causes for challenges that we see here on the screen. And we also see at the bottom, there's a large percentage of transfer and first generation students in this cohort. But an awareness of specific challenges would suggest that there may be an inequity in the instruction as it appears to have to be learned a learning need for non-white students that is not sufficiently being met. Looking at one other demographic, students that transfer in demonstrated a strong knowledge of music theory and a pretty similar effect of singing and varieties of pedagogy. But this data demonstrate that there may be inequity in preparation that supports pedagogical application of repertoires for developmental levels, representative works, and appropriate ped pedagogy. Although these constructions are taught in the latter part of the degree program, these must be foundational understandings that support pedagogical application that is not presented for transfer students, or it may be a factor of ethnicity, as you see in the bottom graphs. Further inquiry is needed to understand why transfer students are having more troubles in these particular areas than the non-transfer students. So for a quick recap, we now have data that started as an SLO, refined into measurable items, and now becomes visualized to determine the extent of student learning. So where do we go now? How have we used this information up until this point? So these data allow us to view the music education program from various perspectives and make informed decisions from the program level down to specific instruction within courses. We can look at the curriculum regarding content and scope and sequence as a result of student success or struggles. As Fred mentioned earlier, we can also disaggregate the data to be able to address certain issues. Uh, specifically, if we look right at the, the transfer students, as we begin to look at not only their academic uh, hindrances or struggles that they may face, in our other research, we find that there are other uh, personal and social issues that they, that they encounter as they change campuses. When they go from either a four-year to a four-year or a two-year or to a four-year institution, there are other factors in play. And so being able to understand all of those dynamics and how that impacts how the students are working within the environment, that's going to help us make these decisions and allow us to contextualize that a little more clearly. Now, from there, we can critically examine courses for their content and appropriateness within the program. We can investigate specific tasks and their accompanying measures to determine if these are valid, reliable, and fair. Then we can make changes to content delivery. We can alter tasks, or we can begin to uh, work with the delivery method to ensure student learning in our classroom. The setup of this process allows for, like I mentioned earlier, surgical precision when making prescribed changes. Here are just a few examples. Number one, we create new courses. Over the course of the past seven years, we have created new courses when we've seen these gaps emerge. Two specifically were a sophomore level course where in the latter portion, we kept noticing that students were having struggles writing learning objectives. 
and understanding how to frame outcomes when it came to the musical classroom. And so we decided, okay, well, part of that, it was for lack of better term, a language barrier. So they would take courses in the College of Education and trying to translate writing outcomes for a math classroom or an English classroom, there was a disconnect. And so we decided, okay, as sophomores, we can teach them the foundations of writing objectives in the music classroom. And then as they go over to the College of Education and take this course, then that bridge is already built. They can label all of the new processes that they are going through and they will understand how those processes work, but they already understand it from the musical perspective. So that was one area where the assessment led us to the creation of a new course. Likewise, with there was a gap in knowledge uh, when, when it came to improvisation, uh, specifically within the music classroom, uh, there was a gap when it came to uh, pedagogy, when it came to working with students early at the secondary level, whether that be instrumentalists or vocalists, of how do we process music when we learn it? And so that was the evolution of our beginning band and, or beginning ensembles and jazz techniques course. So we are able to look at pedagogy. We're able to look at improvisation, both within early and beginning ensembles, as well as other ensembles, whether that be a vocal jazz group or whether that be your jazz ensemble. But there is going to be a way for us to address both of those through this new course. Another adjustment that we see also is a sequence adjustment. So adjusting curriculum to be focused on teacher development. And so one of the things that we have seen through this process is that there is a clear structure that needs to happen for the students to have the best experience and to be able to perform the strongest and with the most understanding of the profession when they get to their student teaching semester. And so over the years, we have worked this process out to where now students won't be able to take courses out of sequence. They take the same sequence and we, we've seen a higher performance of those students during their student teaching semester. Um, we've also found that the hands-on experience and the workshop experience of being able to work on these skills as collaborators was increasingly important as they go out into the classroom. And that became even more so during the pandemic when we had to find ways to collaborate creatively. So one of the topics that we, that we encountered was we flipped a lot of our coursework. The lectures, the content delivery occurred outside of course. And we would have workshops where we would work on these skills. We would uh, test the knowledge. We would have those question and answer sessions. And what we found was that the students would engage in the content and think more critically about it when they would come to class. And then the final one was the assessment adjustments. So the creation of new measures for the current embedded assessments. As we went through, we found where the students were most successful we also found where they struggled. And this goes back to the visualization. We were able to pinpoint, and it might be, okay, they need a little more work on their pedagogical skills, or they need a little bit more work on their ability to describe and analyze a piece of music. So this allowed us to address that through the assessment and through the scoring device. So we would alter the task to emphasize that describing and that analysis part just a little bit more. And then we would score that to provide specific and meaningful and timely feedback right after they completed the task. And so those were some of the assessment adjustments and we created new ones as well. 
Um, everything from the assessment portfolio, which I mentioned earlier, we have a set of, of video reflections that we have now uh, worked into both their advanced methods course and through the student teaching semester, the addition of mock interviews to be able to see themselves in an interview situation and how to uh, work through their professionalism. Each of these changes allowed us to provide specific attention to the strengths and weaknesses of our program. These changes are always ongoing and we review them each semester to determine any changes needed for the upcoming academic year. And we meet on a regular basis, even outside of those annual meetings um, as faculty. So we're constantly having conversations about what's going well, um, what things are we going to try, uh, how is that going to impact our assessments? And then we review those at the end of each semester. And we have found this to be an effective approach uh, to program assessment and making efficient use of our learning management system and the data visualization software to collect, analyze, and visualize the data. Having that in front of us as we are having discussions, we'll have the discussion and then we will consult the data in the visualization package and then we can see, oh, that's why we're having this issue. What if we did this? What if we did that? And so that's what ends up supporting, providing inertia to our conversations for continual uh, program improvement and enhancement. We'd like to thank you for attending our session today. Please don't he hesitate to contact us with any questions about the process or our tasks and our visualizations. And then have a great rest of the conference.